Whether it's a cringy breakup album, an album so bad no one knows how it was even released, or simply a mediocre album that caused fans to switch up, the music industry is a very fickle place. No artist really knows what the outcome of releasing an album could be. Best case scenario, it goes number one and you gain tons of fans, but today we're going to be looking at the worst case. We're going to be looking into artists that ruin their career after dropping just one album. First, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, one, this video was inspired by Jamari's video about Chance the Rapper who of course is the perfect example of this so you know I had to include him in this one as well so shout out to Jamari for the video idea and two not necessarily everyone on this list ruined their careers I think every artist in general has a chance to make a comeback but in this video specifically we're going to be looking at a few different cases like people who ruined their reputations people who tremendously lowered their expectations from fans or people who just straight up ruined their careers so even if these artists do have a handful of monthly listeners or they're rich and set for life these are some artists that drop some stinkers that will forever stain their careers. So make sure to keep that in mind while watching and let's continue with the video. So like I said, Chance the Rapper is probably one of the biggest examples of this topic. He began rapping in middle school and began working on his first mixtape in high school. He had released some music and had a little bit of buzz, and then released his debut mixtape 10 Day in 2012. Chance got a decent amount of attention, especially locally, and even got some recognition from Complex and Forbes. He also got into contact with Childish Gambino and featured on his mixtape and also opened for him on tour. The next year, he released his classic mixtape Acid Rap, with features from plenty of talented artists, which led to Chance really moving up in the music industry. He was nominated for Best Mixtape of the Year at the BET Awards, he began touring, was featured in commercials, and also performed at Lollapalooza. Then in 2014, he was an XXL freshman and started appearing in tons of other things in the following years. He also met Kanye in 2014, who was one of his favorite artists of all time, and they eventually began to work together on Kanye's album The Life of Pablo. When this album released in 2016, Chance was all over it with writing credits and multiple verses. It was also on this album that Chance said, I met Kanye West, I'm never gonna fail, which would eventually become an iconic line for a variety of reasons. Regardless, Chance the Rapper was everywhere and people loved him for his personality. He had a very positive and friendly vibe to him and he was also becoming more open about his religion which made some people like him even more. Following his busy years and recent work on Life of Pablo, Chance the Rapper released Coloring Book which was his third mixtape. People loved this album. It sold 38,000 copies first week and hit number 8 on the Billboard 200 despite being released exclusively on Apple Music. Chance was on top of the world and had been working with tons of brands like H&M, Nestle, and more. He threw a festival in Chicago and went on tour following his mixtape. In 2017, Chance performed at the Grammys, was nominated for seven, and won three Grammy Awards. He headlined an event at the Obama Foundation and was in a Super Bowl commercial for Doritos. He also teased a collab with Kanye, but unfortunately that never ended up happening. Chance the Rapper was on his way to becoming a certified A-list celebrity. Liberty. But then, on July 6 of 2019, he released his debut album, The Big Day. Nearly a decade into his career, Chance the Rapper released his debut studio album, and it was entirely dedicated to his wife, Kirsten Corley. The Big Day was heavily influenced by his marriage that had happened in March of that year, and it wasn't really received too poorly by critics, but the internet absolutely tore it up. I'm sure you guys all remember this meme. Oh, I love my wife. I love my wife. Ah! Let's go ride a bike with my wife. My wife is real young, my wife is real small. Let's go to the beach and play with a beach ball. Praise Jesus God and my wife. Let's go to the beach and ride a bike. This actually became such a big meme that he even has a page on Know Your Meme explaining the whole situation. Genius also even made a video describing every single time Chance mentioned his wife on this album. Chance was clowned all over the internet for this for a very long time to come. And as I'm sure many of you know, it's really hard to break out of the meme status. Once someone makes you into a meme, it will likely follow you around for your entire career. And I do feel bad for Chance because I honestly didn't think the album was that bad, but I also enjoy pretty much anything with a melody and a rhythm, so maybe I'm not the best critic. Regardless, following the release of this album, his career took a turn for the worse. Chance was arguing back and forth with fans on Twitter who were critiquing his album. He was arguing back and forth with one guy for a little bit, constantly getting ratioed in the process. Some people even thought he was hacked because it was so irregular for him to act like this. He also canceled his tour because of what people speculated was low ticket sales. Chance said that he had to cancel the tour to spend time with his family 
family and he did just have a second kid but because there were bogo sales going for tickets and the tour had been postponed it wouldn't be too surprising if ticket sales weren't great however apparently all of this could have been avoided if chance had just listened to his manager chance had recently fired his manager pat corcoran and even more recently pat filed a lawsuit against him the lawsuit was mostly about money that pat was owed however he also mentioned the big day pat said that chance was ignoring his advice about the album and even blamed him for poor reception and poor ticket sales which confirms the theory that he canceled his tour because of poor ticket sales on top of all of that he was recently seen dancing with some random girls which had people questioning how he can make an entire album about his wife and then do that regardless chance's situation is very unfortunate because he is very talented since the big day incident in 2019 he hasn't released an album and he has released some solid music and has a decent amount of fans but he really really hurt his career after that album Robin Thicke is an artist that fell off way quicker than he blew up. I remember listening to Blurred Lines and watching the video when I was in like 6th grade and I don't remember hearing anything about Robin Thicke since. So Robin Thicke was born into a family already in the industry with his mom being Gloria Loring, an actress and singer, and his dad being Alan Thicke, an actor. Robin also did a little bit of acting as he grew up, however he eventually took an interest in music. He made a group called As One and recorded a demo tape with his group. Somehow, the R&B singer Brian McKnight got a hold of his demo tape and began to work with Robin. Anyways, after working with Brian McKnight for a while, he was able to make more connections that led to him signing with Interscope Records at the age of only 16. Robin was first able to work his way into the industry by writing and producing songs for other artists, but then in 1999, at the age of 22, he began making his first album. He released a song called When I Get You Alone, which even reached the charts across the world, which is pretty impressive for a first song. Following that success, he released his album A Beautiful World, which didn't do so super well, especially when you put it next to his debut single, but by 2012 it did sell about 120,000 copies. And while like I said the album didn't perform super well, a lot of people in the music industry were actually able to find out about Robin because of this album and they thought he was pretty talented. One of those people was Pharrell, who produced his next single Wanna Love You Girl. Then he released his next album The Evolution of Robin Thicke in 2006 which even featured Lil Wayne. Along with that album came the song Lost Without You, which was his breakout hit. Robin continued steadily releasing albums over the next seven years and was growing his fan base. But everything would change on March 26 of 2013 when Robin Thicke released his song Blurred Lines with T.I. and Pharrell, which was released as the lead single to his upcoming album. As I'm sure you all know, Blurred Lines absolutely blew up. Since the song was released, it has been certified diamond and it was also the 13th biggest song of the 2010s. He released his album Blurred Lines a few months later and it sold 177,000 copies. But all of that success was not not without controversy. Robin took the brunt of the criticism for the lyrics, although they were mostly written by Pharrell, because many people thought this song was promoting culture, with the phrase blurred lines referring to issues of consent. However, Pharrell has said that he was referring to being rejected. The music video and song were also under fire for being misogynistic. Regardless, the song was a huge success, and it brought Robin to a whole nother level that he would never see again. Also in August of 2013, during the MTV Video Music Awards, Robin performed blurred lines with Miley Cyrus which resulted in another huge controversy with people saying it was too raunchy or too sexist and other things along those lines. It was actually the most tweeted about event ever with 360,000 tweets about it per minute which is absolutely insane. Regardless, it was an event that would foreshadow the downfall of Robin Thicke's career. Following the VMAs, pictures of Robin grabbing some girl's butt circulated the internet which was a big deal because he was married to the actress slash model Paula Patton. They had met when he was 14 and had been together for 21 years. She helped him write songs, was in his music videos, and was on the cover for one of his albums. They were both very public and very close. But on February 4th of 2014, Paula Patton and Robin Thicke divorced. This was the inspiration for Robin's next album called Paula, which was an album all about his ex-wife that was released in 2014. It was made in just a month, and it shows. With songs like You're My Fantasy, Get Her Back, Still Madly Crazy, Love Can Grow Back, and Too Little Too Late, it's pretty obvious what the album is about. On Get Her Back, Robin expresses his regrets in his relationship and on a little too late he does the same thing. The video for Get Her Back was even weirder with text messages flashing with things like we had everything. Why 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 why? I can't make love to you anymore. I wrote a whole album about you. To which she responds I don't care. So I'm sure you guys are getting a pretty good picture of this album. It was basically 
basically just a really cringy album about wanting his ex-wife back. The music itself wasn't terrible, but the lyrics and the overall message were pretty rough. One critic even called it one of the creepiest albums ever made. He would even say things like help me get her back while performing his songs live. It was really just a very pathetic album that came off as very weird. This album sold 24,000 copies in the US, which is crazy in comparison to his previous 177,000. And what's even worse is it sold 550 copies in Canada, 530 copies in the UK, and 54 copies in Australia. That's not short for thousand either. Those are triple digit numbers right there. Robin himself did say that he regrets releasing the album commercially because it was so personal, and Paula has never commented on it, but I do feel pretty bad for her that it even exists. Following Paula, Robin didn't release an album until 2021, about seven years later. Also, I want to give a shout out to Todd in the Shadows. I found him while making this video, and he did a much more in-depth video on this subject. He's a series called Train Records, where he covers albums that were just train wrecks. So it's pretty interesting. He makes really good videos and I just found him recently. So I want to share his channel with you guys. Yeah, he's really entertaining, much more in depth. I'll leave a link below. So Roddy Rich is someone who I definitely think could make a comeback because he is very talented. But ever since releasing his sophomore album, his career has been on a very steep decline. He began making music when he was 16 years old and released his first mixtape, Feed the Streets, in 2017. It had a handful of popular songs that caught the attention of many artists like Mustard, Meek Mill, Nipsey Hussle, and O3 Greedo. These connections were instrumental in helping his career grow. Following that project, he released an EP called Before the Fame and also performed at a Nipsey Hustle concert in LA. That same year, he began the rollout for his next mixtape, Feed the Streets 2, with the release of the single Die Young. This song would become Roddy's breakout hit, helping him blow up and carve out a lane for himself and also get the attention of other artists. He performed with Meek Mill, featured on his album alongside Future and Young Thug, and then he released Feed the Streets 2. It peaked at 67 on the Billboard 200. In 2019, he featured on Nipsey Hussle's song Racks in the Middle, which led to him getting a Grammy for Best Rap Performance. He featured on a remix of Post Malone's Wow, and then was on the song Ballin' with Mustard, a song from Mustard's album Perfect 10. This song was a huge success, and this is how I personally found Roddy, because that was a really good song. The album itself is certified gold, so it definitely helped Roddy get some exposure. Then in late 2019, with all of his buzz and industry connections, Roddy began rolling out his debut album. He released a few really good singles and then dropped the album Please Excuse Me For Being Antisocial on December 6th of 2019. The album itself was really good but one song in particular stood out, and that song was The Box. The Box had a really weird intro which led to it becoming a huge meme on TikTok with over 1.2 million videos being made to that sound. However, the song itself was also really good, which helped it blow up and become a smash hit. The Box has 1.6 billion streams on Spotify, spent 11 weeks at number one on the Billboard Hot 100, and is certified diamond. This was no doubt Roddy's biggest song to date, and he even had artists like Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez begging their fans to get their songs to number one. The album itself too was really good and it sold 101,000 copies first week. However, it would be all downhill from there. In an interview with GQ in 2020, Roddy Rich said that he was making his second album and that it was a full-blown masterpiece, a real idea and a real body of work. And based on what he had just previously delivered, people were very excited for his next album. However, people were waiting and waiting for a very long time. Other than a couple features here and there and his appearance on Rockstar, Roddy Rich was not releasing his album. Then, finally about two years after releasing his debut album, he released his sophomore album Live Life Fast. Like I said, it was extremely hyped up and he even said that the album had a no skip policy, but it did not live up to the expectations at all. The album wasn't even bad. It was just so mediocre that fans were very let down. He got a lot of hate with comments like, he must be living life fast because the album sounds like he made it in a week and Roddy saw the hate immediately announcing that he would be dropping another album next year. The album also only sold 62,000 copies first week which is about 40% less than what his previous album sold. Then a couple months after releasing that album Roddy Rich posted a snippet of some new music to Twitter and the fans absolutely clowned him for it so much so that he deactivated his Twitter and posted on Instagram saying guess I'm a flop now. One person even referred to it as the chance the rapper ification of Roddy Rich. And while that's a terrible phrase, it is true. Because like I said, once you become a meme or start getting clowned on, it's really hard to break out of that. However, Roddy did later do an interview with DJ Academics in which he gave other reasons as for why he left the internet. Don't tell me you let these niggas get to you. Hell nah. You gotta understand, before the fame, I wasn't an Instagram nigga. 
They'll tell you I wasn't no Instagram. I wasn't getting on Instagram live, taking pictures. I don't even take pictures of myself. I really be putting shit on. It was clear though that the internet was getting to him. Especially since he said in an interview, a lot of people don't have to deal with more than 10 people. So just imagine 7 million that see your posts every day. Roddy was very clearly under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. He even addressed these expectations in an interview. What do you say to yourself when you pe when the people try to have these expectations and they're so unrealistic? Mm, I would, you know, I, I mean, that's on them. You know what mm. I mean? I feel like I've just been having a great career in rap. You know what I'm saying? Every album is not going to be the greatest album to ever live. And, mm -hmm. You know, we got to be okay with that. Then about a year after dropping his previous album, Roddy released the album Feed the Streets 3, which only sold 38,000 copies first week. So it's obvious ever since releasing Live Life Fast paired with the whole Twitter snippet incident thing, Roddy's career has been on a decline. And it is very unfortunate because he is a very talented artist. But like the interview from earlier alluded to, he has really high expectations following his debut album anti -Soul social because it was a really good album so it is unfortunate but i think roddy could easily come back if he just drops an album that's on par with or better than anti-social so I covered YBN Amir's career in a previous video, but he had a catastrophic fall off after releasing his debut album, so I just had to include him in this one. Namir and his friends met on Xbox and formed a collective called YBN and started making music together. He started releasing music solo and with YBN members in 2015 and continued releasing music from there. He was just making music for fun with his friends like a lot of people in high school do, and he released a couple of mixtapes in 2016 and 2017. All of his music was made with just a blue snowball microphone in his bedroom Room, so it was clear he wasn't super serious. Namir was young, still in high school, and having fun with his music when he released a song rubbing off the paint. The song began to get attention, and then Worldstar reached out to him to post the song. So they posted it on their channel and it went mega viral. Rubbing off the paint was a huge hit. It hit 46 on the Billboard Hot 100, went two times platinum, and became a classic song from the SoundCloud era. To this day, Rubbing Off the Paint is one of his biggest songs. He continued releasing music like Bounce Out with That, The Race Remix, and and more that helped him grow steadily as they were fairly good. He followed up his massive success with YBN The Mixtape, a mixtape featuring himself and the other YBN members. His success helped put other people like Almighty J and Corday on the map as well. This mixtape featured artists like Gucci Mane, MGK, Lil Skies, Wiz Khalifa, Chris Brown, and more. They were clearly blowing up and becoming much more successful. By this point, Namir had also signed with Atlantic Records and was also featured by XXL in their 2018 freshman class, which was a lot more relevant back then. Speaking of XXL, I've been thinking of covering their decline and how they're kind of not as relevant as they used to be, so let me know in the comments if you think that's interesting. If it's not, I won't do it, but if it is, I will. Anyways, Namir was in a really good spot, but hadn't been releasing much solo music other than a few features here and there. He released Two Seater with G-Eazy and Offset, which had some decent success, and the song Opstapa, which didn't really blow up until it hit TikTok, which then led to a remix featuring 21 Savage. But other than that, fans were waiting for his debut album. However, he wasn't releasing anything, so like I said with the fast food thing, he was falling into irrelevancy. Then finally, about four years after coming out with Rubbing Off the Paint, he released his debut album Visionland. This album was not good and also featured a song called Soul Train that turned him into a huge meme. Like we discussed with Roddy Rich and Chance the Rapper, that is the last thing you want to happen to you in the music industry, especially if you don't have the music to back it up. On top of that, Visionland sold 4,000 copies, which also added to how much people were making fun of him on the internet. The music quality wasn't there, he waited 40 years to drop and he was turned into a meme. He kept digging a deeper hole for himself over the years as he was doing cringy dances, arguing with fans, begging No Jumper to not post memes of him, and he even mentioned starting an OnlyFans. YBN Namir had become the laughing stock of the rap community. To be fair to Namir, there were some issues with his label that we don't know too much about. However, he has tweeted a few times about how much he hated his label and how he couldn't wait to get out of his deal with Atlantic, so it's very possible that the label was delaying the release of his album, or maybe they put it on the back burner, or maybe they even had a hand in the creative decision. Regardless, after releasing Visionland, YBN Namir's career has come crashing down. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please make sure to leave a like down below. Other than that, though, this has been Matty Balls, and I will see you guys next week.